Okay, we've been going on in the book of uh, Acts, and uh, we came to that point where Paul is being uh, taken out of uh, Jerusalem, and never again will he have relationship with Jerusalem. And as we were examining that language very carefully, we found a word that uh, was kind of different in that it talked about a couple of hundred spearmen who were assisting and guarding Paul as he was taken out of Caesarea. And when we looked at that word spearman very carefully, we found that it, uh, it uh, uh, was a very curious word, and, uh, and it literally it meant those who take the right hand, those who take the right hand. And uh, it, it was a word that was not even used in connection with any uh, Greek literature of that day. And there yet it appears uh, on the pages of the Bible. And because the Bible is absolutely trustworthy and dependable, we know, therefore, it had to have a very important meaning. Well, as a matter of fact, we found that the right hand had to do with those who have become believers. But then, as we, as we puzzled about that, we were led to John chapter 21, where we read about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the seven disciples uh, go, deciding to go fishing. And then, remember, they saw Jesus on the shore. They didn't recognize him, but he said, have you any meat? And uh, then they said no, and he says, well, tr- I... I Put your nets down on the right side. And actually, the right side is literally the right-hand part of the, of the boat. Uh, and, uh, and again, we wondered, well, that's very curious, the right side again, and, or the right hand again. And as a matter of fact, what happened was that uh, we saw that there was a great multitude of fish, 153, in fact, that were caught. There were so many they couldn't get them into the boat, and they had to drag the the net to shore. Well, uh, as we talked about that, we began to see that in both instances, both in Acts 23, where we had been studying, as well as here in John 21, God is actually relating not to the period of time during which the church has been used of God to send the gospel into the world, but it is after that time, and, uh, and uh, at a time when the church has, has, is no longer functioning as the lighthouse of the gospel, where, uh, because its work has been finished. Look at Revelation 7 again. It says in, in, uh, in uh, verse uh, 8, let's see. It's it's giving 12,000 from each of the tribes. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now that made the 144,000. The complete fullness of all those who were to become saved. And then notice verse 9. After this, after this, I beheld. After the 144,000 were saved, I beheld a great number which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Notice the parallelism to John chapter 21. Hold your finger there and look at John 21 again. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. In other words, it's like, wait a minute... The 144,000 are sealed. That is the fullness of all those who would be saved through the ministration of the church, the corporate body that has been ministering for over 1,900 years. But finally, their ministry comes to an end. The two witnesses are killed, as we read in Revelation 11. Their work is finished. And and, uh, then uh, uh, there's still a period of three and a half days, and following that three and a half days, the witnesses stand on their feet, and uh, and we learned some time back that they still have a ministry which we identified with the latter rain, that that God is still 
has to reach six billion people who are the 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 uh, the uh, population of a world in which we live a population that is way 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 larger than anything that has ever happened before in history and and so in verse uh, going back to revelation 7 verse 9 a great multitude which no man could number and now i understood why it says no man could number it doesn't mean that that uh, there wasn't a an, was not an exact number of those who would become saved after all if someone would patiently particularly if he used a calculator he could he could uh, eventually uh, uh, number um, uh, one billion believers or a half a billion believers or whatever it is eventually you could get there literally you could number it why does it say which no man could number and I think I understand you see in this latter reign that we're talking about we're talking about a period when the church is not the cornerstone it is simply the gospel well the gospel always is the cornerstone but God works through the corporate body, the church. He had a lot to say about that, and, and, it, and he gave a lot of rules about it. And, but now the gospel is going out, and there's no possibility of establishing churches. When we send the gospel, for example, and this is how literal this is, it's so very literal. When we send the gospel, for example, 24 hours a day to mainland China, uh, who can keep track and who knows those who do become saved? Now, we're absolutely convinced that God's word does not return void. It does accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. We do know that we are, we truly believe with all our heart we're sending the, faithfully sending the true gospel. And we do know it is very listenable because it's on AM radio as well as shortwave radio all over mainland China, just to pick one nation without talking about a lot of other nations where the same thing is happening. And so it's bound to make, God is bound through that to save the elect. He came to seek and to save those who, who, who uh, are the elect of God. But what happens to them? Uh, what is their follow-up? Can they become part of a congregation? Well, there are none. There may be a church in town and they go there and they find out that it's the preacher is a former Seventh-day Adventist, or he's a former Mormon, or he's a former whatever it is, and that's all there is. So he, it is. Or maybe he's a charismatic, or maybe he hasn't the slightest idea what salvation is. And so that isn't a church they can belong to. Are they still bona fide Christians? Absolutely. Still bona fide Christians. They, they have become saved. But they cannot be enumerated. They, we have church roles. We can, you know, if you look at the church statistics, the, the Methodist church can say we have so many million constituents. The Baptist church can say we have so many. Reformed church, whatever it may be, can say we have so many. This congregation can say we have 200 families or we have 50 uh, those, of those who have made confession of faith. The church has always uh, uh, kept numbers, and but now it's a vast multitude which no man can number because they're coming into, uh, they're hearing the gospel and they're hearing it very intensively where the church worked very slowly in bringing the gospel in that uh, uh, you had a, a, a one sermon, maybe two sermons, at, at, let's pick the ideal, Two sermons on Sunday, and uh, and you might have a Bible study during the week. Probably not. Uh, most people did not go to a Bible study, uh, but a few did, and uh, and uh, that was about it. And uh, and if you happen to be in the worship service and a little tired, and and uh, or the minister preaching about something that just didn't happen to to uh, be interesting, you might not. You might go out and say, well. Praise God, I was so glad to worship, but, but uh, really, I, I didn't really get much blessing out of the, out of the, out of the sermon. And uh, in the fault of the sermon, it was maybe your fault, but nevertheless, the potential to learn was very, very reduced. Well, there was a lot of books that were printed, and uh, they are available, and those who are serious could uh, buy 
by good theological books and commentaries and what have you. That would help to some degree. But uh, uh, most people are too busy with their lives. They don't have time, and they're not that kind of a studious student where they are going to pour over these theological books to, in order to learn. But today, when we get the gospel to anybody, we're able to bring it there day after day after day after day. And not just for 15 minutes or a half hour, but, but for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, three hours, four hours. Uh, and so that it's, there's a very intensive teaching, a very intensive teaching that has never, the world has never known about. So here someone becomes saved out in the boonies of China or India or wherever it may be. And, uh, and uh, they, uh, they don't need a pastor to follow up on them. The, the radio itself is following up on them. They are hearing that gospel again and again. And you have experienced that in your own life as you listen to family radio. You've grown in the word a whole lot just by listening, 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 listening. And it's at an intensity that was never known in the church. So that two things are happening in our day. One thing is, is that, that uh, the, the, there's an extensive character of the gospel that is, the world has never known. It's, it's so absolutely extensive. But secondly, it is also a, a uh, gospel that is very, very intensive. Very intensive. And it's reaching places that the church couldn't reach. The church, here, there's a family living up in a, in a, in a and I still remember when we began family radio in New York. I was, uh, I was, I was just in, uh, walking on cloud nine that this had happened because you look at these great big tall apartment buildings uh, and way up there on the uh, 14th floor there's a, someone there who desperately needs the Lord and, and you try to go in there gospel and there's a doorman at the door and says no way you can't go in there and there's no way to get to that man but radio can radio can and uh, now he may be someone who is his whole family abhors the christian gospel but very quietly very secretly in the in his bedroom he can tune in family radio and he can hear the gospel and he can feed on the word and grow in grace and and all the other things and and we don't know anything about him. We don't know anything about him. But, uh, but uh, the church could never do that. Now, of course, of course, in the background of this is God's elect. God did save his elect throughout the more than 1,900 years that God has used the church. Certainly he did. Certainly he did. But nevertheless, the command is, go ye into all the world with the gospel. Go ye into all the world. And that means reach into every apartment building and reach into every hovel and reach into every corner of the world. And, and, uh, this, this, and that's why when you go back to Revelation 7 again, and it talks about a great not, uh, not multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes. And notice verse 14. It's a very, very significant verse. There it says, uh, 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 verse 13, what, uh, the, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? I uh, notice in verse 9 it says, These uh, after this had, that came from all the nations were clothed with white robes. And he said, What are these that are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And he said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of Great tribulation, exactly the same two words we find in Revelation are in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, where it says, And there will be great tribulation such as this world has never known. In other words, God is identifying that closing period of time when the work of the church has been officially completed. They have done their work. And there is a period of silence, and then begins the latter rain. And these are they who came out of that period after the 144,000 had become saved. There is still a great multitude which no man can number simply because the church is not being used any longer as the vehicle to 
evangelize the world. God has these new plans of, of using radio and, uh, and, and these other methods, which is the only mechanism, and, and God has guided the, the uh, secular interests and, and the engineers and everyone else uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, develop and, and, uh, and make all of these fantastic uh, instruments that we are, are useful to us, satellites and, and broadcasting and so on, in order that we can reach millions upon millions with the gospel. All right, there's just a tiny brief overview, I think, of, of where we are. Now, again, it's called Great Tribulation because after 1900 years, it's not a little deal. It's not an insignificant thing that judgment begins with the house of God. This is a, absolutely a, a, uh, a, 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 a terrible thought, a terrible thought, because the house of God, they are, that's where the true believers are. It's easy to read about Babylon. It's easy to read about Palestine. It's easy to read about the Philistines or, or, or a lot of other nations or Egypt that came under the judgment of God or Sodom and Gomorrah, or whatever. But when the Bible starts talking about judgment begins with the house of God, that is something horrible. That is something terrible. Because that house of God has been established by Christ as the vehicle, as the means by which he has evangelized the world for more than 1,900 years. And, and that judgment, that it now comes under judgment, it is a terrible thing, just as terrible as when the Babylonians began to assault uh, Jer Jer Jerusalem and, uh, and are ready to take it and did finally take it and destroy the temple and uh, destroy Israel of that day, which was really a picture or type of what is, has happened when the tribulation began uh, as, uh, as uh, the work of the two witnesses had become finished. And so it is a time of great tribulation. And we who are have grown up in the church, and many of us have, uh, and I have always been in the church ever since I was born, I, uh, and uh, I've been an integral part of it. I've been very active in it, in its, in its uh, local situation, as well as in its, uh, its uh, uh, larger uh, uh, United States covering situation. I've been very active and to look back on it and say now it is no longer, it is no longer used of God to bring the gospel. It has become spiritually dead. It's a good place. It still serves a purpose in this sense as being a place where we can answer to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. Don't neglect the gathering together of ourselves especially as the day draws nigh for comfort. And so we find the churches as a place where we can find mutual fellowship, where we can find others who are of the same mind, and we can comfort one another. And God has commanded this, but insofar as being a, a means of evangelization, no, it work, its work has been done. Its work has been done.